us today that I will listen and each one here will listen to what you're trying to say to each one of us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so our topic today is faith. And as you can see, I've put some nice pretty foils. And I hope that's not all that's going to be there today. I'm asking that the Lord will, will speak to us, will challenge us, will stir us, will, will draw us in. I mean, if I, if I say, guys, do you know what faith is? How many of you are going to keep your hands down? Anybody who doesn't know what is faith, raise your hand. I'm not expecting to see a single hand up. Right? Because you all know what faith is. Faith is the? Let's hear that. Exactly. Next file. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. We all know that. We all know that. But is there more to this? Is there a challenge here? Um, you know, faith is, yeah, I'm hoping for something. I really want, uh, you know, something to happen. Uh, I'm longing for it to happen. Is that faith? What does it mean, the conviction of things not seen? The assurance, the absolute surety that what you have faith for will come to pass. What is faith? Let me see if this works. No? Next file, Lisa. So a couple of uh, weeks ago, I was talking on grace, and we brought up this topic of, of faith that was part of the verse. And um, in that, we have this guy called George Mueller. How many of you have heard of George Mueller? Really? Just that few? All right. So if you look at, you know, heroes of faith, um, over the last century, George Miller's name comes up at the top. This man um, ran an orphanage. And if I remember right, he had about 2,000 kids in that orphanage, and he ran it by faith. And they never asked for money, and God would provide incredible stories of they didn't have milk one day and there are 2,000 children remember I think they had different different number of children at different uh, stages of time but um, and they said okay let's get together in the dining room as, yeah, as usual and let us pray and they got together and they prayed and as they prayed there was a ring on the doorbell and there is a milk truck outside that has broken down and if he, he cannot get his to where he needs to go in time and that milk's going to get spoiled, please can I donate it to the orphanage. And his life was story after story like that. He got on a boat, a ferry, and he was going to travel from, I think it was going, he was going across the, the English canal. And they got into the boat and the boat started along and suddenly it stopped. Maybe halfway into the canal, he walked up to the, the deck of the ferry and he asked the captain, what's happening? And the captain said, can you see the fog is moving in? We cannot move forward as long as there is so much fog. And George Miller told the captain, he said, I have never been late for an appointment I have to keep with the people of God. I have to be there at such and such a time. I've got to get there. Captain said, great to hear that, but I'm not moving without the fog clearing. So he grabbed the captain's hand and says, let us pray. And this captain is like looking at him, what is this guy? And they prayed and in 15 minutes the fog cleared and he reached on time. Faith is the assurance of that which is not seen. Next file. So I just have a, honestly, a bunch of random thoughts about this, but as I was going through 2 Timothy, this thing just hit me so hard. And 2 Timothy 
chapter 1, verse 5 to 3 says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience. Interesting, this bit about the pure conscience. We'll look at that later. As my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you and being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy. And this is Paul talking about this young man called Paul, uh, called Timothy, who Paul says is my son. He's my son in the faith. And there is something that, why, why did he choose Timothy? Why did he choose Timothy? And he says this here. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, it dwelt in your grandmother Lewis and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded is in you also. You know, as I read this, I realized one thing. You can pass your faith downwards. You know, you've, you've, we've all heard this. Our children don't do what they, what we tell them to do. They do what they see us doing. So, terrible. Why can't you just do what we tell you to do? What is this thing of you want to see what we are doing and then you'll do that? You know, parenting would be so easy. All you parents, if your children would just do what you did, do what, they, what you told them to do and didn't do what you did. But isn't parenting being so easy? But that's not how it is. If you want to pass on faith to your children, you have to be men and women of faith. The choices and decisions I make today make a difference to my children and my grandchildren. About a month ago, we went to, to Kerala and went to this, uh, my grandfather's house, my father's father's house, it's an old house, you know, in, in Kerala, and you go in there, and there's this room, and I have such terrible memories, I mean, fun, we had fun, we had hard times, that room was the painful room, because five o'clock in the morning, however tiny you are, you wake up, and you come, and we have family prayer, every single morning, every single morning, and I got in there, and I looked around there, and I, I looked up on the wall, and there are pictures of my forefathers, my grandfather, his father, his father. And as we talked about this, these are old stories that I've heard. And one of them came back to me. It's been, it's been on my heart. My grandfather's grandfather. His name was Omen. <laughs> um... He came from a very wealthy family. And we don't know the details. But I believe when he came of age and he had to join into the family business, he took a call and he took a decision. He said, I cannot be part of this family's wealth because it is, it is, not, um, it is not morally gained. The wealth of this family is not something that I can choose to own because I cannot stand before a righteous God and say, you know, I, I'm part of it, this. So he left, broke, I believe, just with the clothes on his back, and he walked out with, a, with that sense. We don't know, but somewhere I'm saying he knew God, and that's why he made that choice. And that faith... I believe has passed down through the generations. So it is important for us to be men and women of faith. You know, we assume that, that because I'm a Christian, I'm a man of faith. No. Faith is like a muscle. It must be exercised. You have to exercise faith. You have to choose to walk in faith. You have to choose 
to make this a priority in your life. Next file. Sorry, the one before this, Lisa. Yeah. So why is faith so important? Right? What's the big deal? Why are you making so much of a fuss, Adish? There's so many important things. Why faith? What about obedience? Isn't that important? What about righteousness, forgiveness, joy, peace? What about all these things? Are these not important? Why are you, why are you standing up there and trying to say faith, faith, that's what matters? Hey, for me, obedience is more important. That I, I live at peace, that's more important. Why are we saying faith is, is, is one of the most important things? And I have that line up there which says, faith is the currency of heaven. You know, whether we like it or not, if you have money on earth, you can get things done. You can buy things, you can own things, you can get things done. Right? Whether morally or immorally, money makes things happen in this realm. Faith is the currency of heaven. If you have faith, the doors open for you. So let's look at the next file. I don't know if you can see those. Oh, it's quite terrible up there. But let me, let me read that out. Righteousness. Romans 3.22, even the righteousness of God through faith. How are you going to get righteousness? It is through faith. Obedience. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. There is no obedience without faith. Forgiveness. I love this portion. And you know, you, we know the story. There are two parts where this comes in. And Jesus, one part is in the Gospels is telling them, even if they sin against you seven times a day, and they come back and ask you for forgiveness, you forgive them. And the disciples and the apostles said, Lord, give me faith. I need faith for forgiveness. Romans 5, 1, therefore we see we have been justified through faith. We have peace with God. If you want peace with God and man, it comes from your walk in faith. Philippians 1.25, being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy of faith. There is no real joy if it's not based on faith. You see that each and every one of these Let's go to the next file. Our fruits hanging off this tree called faith. Each and every one of these things that we talked about are fruits that hang off this tree called faith. And there you have that, that verse right at the bottom which says, but faith works through love. That tree has to be planted in God's love. So when you look at all of these, which is the most important one? Which is the most important one? That's right. It is love. Because without that, there is no faith. It is in the love of God that only in the love of God that faith can grow. You know, we looked at that statement which George Miller ma made. He says that God will do what he says he will do. That is faith. But for that you have to know that God loves you and that God is a God of love. Why is... So we know that the root bed is love. Without love you cannot have faith. Let's go back to the question. Why is faith so important? Next point. I want you to think about this. Lord, I served in the church. Lord, I gave money to the poor. Lord, I helped all those downtrodden people. Lord, I did this, I did that. And Paul tells you, you know, 
there is a situation where you can do all of it and it amounts to nothing. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible to please God. Why is faith so important? Because without faith, nothing you're doing has any value. Nothing you're doing has any value. You know, I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but I want it for you, I want it to sink down. And I want you to build this concrete foundation which says, I need faith. I must be a man of faith. I must be a woman of faith. I must be able to pass down this faith to my children and my grandchildren. They must see it in me. Just last week we were at my father-in-law's funeral. He was a man of faith. His favorite verse was put up there, I know whom I have believed in. And he is able. That is a declaration of faith. That is a life saying, I can, I can bet everything on this. I know whom I've believed in. And even as you know, Anu was sharing over there, when they were, when Anu was five years old, on Jan fourth, uh, that would have been what 1975. Um, they were in Africa. They were living in a house, and the petrol caught fire. They had petrol for a generator, and the petrol caught fire, and the whole house went up in flames. And they had to run for their lives. And they went in, and then her father went to get, um, tried to go and get something as his house was in flames. And her brother, who was three years old, ran into the house behind him. And the whole house is in flames. And her mother ran in, and you know, they were saying at one point, all you could see is the fire. And then she ran out with this little fellow. Her sari caught fire. They had to rip it off her. And they came and stood outside and watched everything that they owned, every material position of theirs burnt to the ground. They didn't even have the clothes on their back. Her father didn't even have a shirt. His, her mother didn't even have her sari. And the villagers came and wrapped blankets around them and took them. And that evening, as they sat together, her father said, and God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him. And over time, God returned everything. But when you're in a moment of crisis, how do you respond? Do we break up and fall apart and start crying and you know oh God where are you why have you done this to me I thought you loved me why am I in this situation why God why and we throw our faith out of the window Bible talks about those who shipwreck their faith What happens? The rocks are right ahead of you and you drive your ship into the rocks. That's how you shipwreck your faith. Because you let the rocks, your eyes are on the rocks. But God is calling us as a church, as a generation, to be people of faith who will respond in the worst of situations with God, I trust you. God, I trust you. You know, the, if this verse is not challenging enough, the Bible says the exact opposite of this is also true. The corollary of this is true. Next foil. Whatever, whatever, whatever 
is not of faith is sin there is something wrong with this verse there is no right to be in the bible so many wonderful things we do which we don't do from faith we just do it because it's you know hey that's that's a nice thing to do and guess what if i do that those people will look and say oh what a nice guy he is and if i help my neighbor my neighbor will help me whatever is not from faith is sin is faith important is this one of those things that you've got to keep coming back to and saying lord am i living a life of faith or am i just living am i just reacting to life every day some new situation new circumstance new new problem am i responding every single time with faith or am i just reacting just like everybody around around me would it is impossible to please god without faith whatever is not from faith is sin next for now chain quoted this verse today but without faith is impossible to please him for he who comes to god must believe that he is that he is what that he is what that he is who he says he is he is not our idea of who he thinks of who we think he is he is who he says he is and each of us come from different backgrounds and and for some of us god the father may be this jolly santa claus in the sky whose job is to give me presents all the time and there may be others who have this image of the strict headmaster who's waiting to rap me on the knuckles every time i move out of place that's not who he says he is he is a father who loves us who has written a purpose and a destiny over each one of our lives and he has loved us from the foundations of the world and if you actually go through that second timothy you keep going on it says that that this purpose and his will is something that he wrote over us before time began and he's a father who disciplines us and corrects us and doesn't let us run wild <coughs> but draws us keeps drawing us back to him that's who he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him i tell you you need faith unless you have faith unless you believe that he is a rewarder of those who seek him you won't seek him so my question today to you is are you seeking him is seeking god an active choice you are making how was 2023 let me tell you the lord told me seek my face your face will i seek o lord i found the verse i put it on my phone screen and i never saw his face because life happens and you get busy and life goes by but i thank god he is not a god who who puts us on a shelf and he says i told you to do something you didn't okay out of the way i'll find somebody else you know he wants you he has only one brian he has only one bimi he has only one nitin he is only one of you and he loved you before the foundations of the world and he is not willing that you will waste your life he is not willing and he will not let go and he will come after you and he will stir you and he will draw you and he will pull you back and he will say seek my face He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Can we take that and say Lord I want to be a man who seeks your face. I want to be the person who seeks you because you are a rewarder of those who seek you. 
I want to I want to challenge each one of us. Is 2024 going to be like 2023? Is that all you want? Is this it? Is this where you are right now in your Christian life? It. I am not here to bring condemnation on you. I am here to challenge you that God has so much more in store for you. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's what he's calling you into. Can you say that's what my 2023 was? Joy unspeakable, full of glory. If not, let's press forward. Let's press forward. Okay, so let's look at some of the enemies of, of faith. Next file. That projection is a waste. Enemies of faith, natural senses. Our natural sense. Like we talked about in the beginning, we live in a world where you touch and feel and judge and sense and react. And I believe that can be an enemy of faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. You're not supposed to walk by sight. You're supposed to walk by faith. Isaiah 11, 13, the 3 says, his delight, and it's talking about Jesus, his delight is in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. As it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. You have to walk in the revelation in the spirit. If all you have a grid for is the natural, you are missing out completely on what the Christian life is meant to be. God has revealed them to us through the spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. And we leave it there, but that's not how the passage ends. Oh, nobody knows God's ways. That's God. He is strange and mysterious. I'm just a man. Let me just keep living my life. That's not what the scripture is saying. No one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. And then what? Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. You know, there's so much as Christians that we don't know. And it is absolutely okay to say, I don't know. But just like a child in school says, I don't know, but then five years later, he can't still be saying, I don't know. Because by then, the teacher's been teaching him these things. Here, the scripture tells us God wants us to know. And because the deep things of God, what is it talking about? It says the deep things of God, God wants us to know. Because he, that's why he put his spirit inside me. That spirit he put inside me, so that the deep things of God, which only that spirit knows, now dwells inside of us. These things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches. Does the Bible have a problem with man's wisdom? No, oh, there are places for that. But if your Christian life is being lived by man's wisdom, you're not going far. These things we speak, not in words with man's wisdom, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural does not receive the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? We love to leave the verse there. That's not what it says. It says, but we have the mind of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. What arrogance.
What would you do in a group of Christians if a man stood up and said, I have the mind of Christ? What a proud brother he is. No, he's just telling you what scripture says. But it's in the spirit. And if you know how to listen to the spirit, you can have the mind of Christ in every single matter. And that is where I walk by faith and not by sight. If your life is locked into the grid of the natural, you will miss out on the supernatural that God wants to do. I ask you, I'm asking you to, 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 to wrestle with God and say, God, here I am. I don't want my life to be natural. I don't want only what, what's normal and natural to be part of my life. I'm here, I'm here and I'm saying, Lord, I, ha I want to be a man of faith. Give me a grid for the supernatural. Give me a grid for, the, for, for things which don't make sense. They don't make sense. I have the story which doesn't make sense. We took that car on loan and I, I don't like loans. I've never had loans until I took that car because the house was on loan. But I just didn't like the idea of buying a car on loan. I always, you know, I'll buy a second-hand car with the less money that I have. And, and I just felt the Lord saying, no, you take that car. And we bought it and it turned out to be a great blessing because we, we would have two families sit in that car and drive to Orissa. For about four or five years, we went for mission trips over there. And I am this finance guy, and I have Excel sheets. And uh, not just Excel sheets, but the Excel sheets now have you have graphs, which shows the EMI curve. I can see some people nodding. <laughs> some of you are, know what I'm talking about. The EMI curve, and very, every time you make a prepayment, the graph will drop and tell you how much is balance and how much every month is going on interest and how much is actually pre principal repayment and that's the kind of guy I am I need to have all my numbers in front of me and I've got this and I'm trying to clear this car loan as quickly as possible and guess what we get this lovely bonus and I get about two lakhs and with two lakhs I can clear the loan and I'm so excited I'm like yeah, great I'm gonna clear the loan and during one of those times when we were ta I was talking to the Lord the Lord said I want you to give that money to so-and-so I was like, Lord, my car loan. I want you to give that money to so and so. So I gave the money. And I gave the money to them. And the next month, I got an SMS which seemed, didn't make sense. And they gave me a, a code, a bank code saying, bank code so and so, something, something, contact your bank. And I googled it and it is final payment for your car loan. And I called the bank, and they said, sir, 7,000 rupees final payment for your car loan. Please, can you close it? God paid up my two lakhs. I paid it there. He put the rest into that account. If you do not have a grid for the supernatural, you're going to live freaked out all the time because this is the God who we live with. He does crazy stuff. He just cleared that loan. You know, the twist side to that story is every time I think of going back to that guy and asking for the money back, the Lord says, what are you talking about? I already paid you back. And he's never allowed me to ask that man for the money back. I know the Bible says, you know, when you lend to somebody, don't ask it back. But I've been tempted so many times to ask it back. And every time the Lord has stopped me saying, I cleared your loan. You don't have the right to go and ask it the money back. God wants each one of us to live a supernatural life. To live by faith, not by sight. Next point. Your next enemy of faith is fear. We've all heard this, right? The Bible says 365 times, do not fear, right? And I think there are variations on that, but somebody's kind of put that together. 365 times, do not fear. So, does God want us to fear? Does God want us to fear? Does God want you, expect you to live in fear? Let's hear that loudly. Say that to yourself. God does not 
want me to live in fear. He wants you to live in faith. Are you going to live a life without trials, without difficulties, without storms, without sicknesses, without terrible situations coming? No, you're going to go through all of that. But he does not want you to live in fear. Mark chapter 4, 39 and 40. What's happening? These are hardcore fishermen who probably learned how to swim before they could walk. They grew up on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. They've gone swimming there for, as they were kids. They're in a boat. The storm is so bad that these fishermen are crying out for fear. And they're crying out. And they go to the Lord who is sleeping on a pillow in a boat that the storm is so bad the fishermen think they're going to drown. And they wake him up saying, don't you care that we are going to die? Have we said that to the Lord? Maybe not those exact words, but have you not told him there are times when you say, Lord, don't you care? Don't you see what I'm going through? Do you care? And they wake him up. And he woke up. The Bible says he rebuked the wind and to the sea and he said, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm and he turned and said to them, oh, you poor little ones, don't worry, I'll take care of you. Yeah? Is that what he said? He said, why are you so fearful? Yeah, there's a storm. Yeah, the waves are breaking into the boat. And the storm is so bad you think you're going to die. But what is the response he expects from them? Faith, not fear. Not fear. How is it? How is it that you have no faith? The Lord is challenging each one of us today. Why are you so fearful? How is it you have no faith? Same story, Matthew 9, 26. Why are you so fearful? Oh, you of little faith. We read that portion in Timothy, where Timothy, is, he says that, where Paul says that to Timothy, he says that genuine faith that is in you, Timothy. You got it from your grandmother and your mother. And then he says this verse. For God has not given to us a spirit of fear. Genuine faith opposed by fear. And God has not given you a spirit of fear. And you can say, no, no, by nature I'm very timid and I'm not like you bold and I cannot make so much noise from the pulpit and all that. And maybe some of that is temperament, but let me tell you, God has not given you a spirit of fear. What kind of spirit has he given you? A spirit of power. Power. And of love. And of a sound mind. God does not want your fears to incapacitate you. Where, oh, you're so worried and you're so fearful, you cannot act, you cannot do the right thing, you don't know how to respond. That is not God's will. And it's not that God is telling you, you must be like this. It's not God is telling you, why are, you know, he, yeah, in this case he says, where's your faith? But here this verse is telling you, I have given you the spirit, the spirit that is in you right now. If you are born again and you are a child of God, the spirit that you have in you is a spirit of power, it is a spirit of love, and it is a spirit of a sound mind. And he wants you to walk in that. 1 John 4.18 There is no fear in love, but cause 
perfect love casts out fear fear involves torment but he who fears has not been made perfect in love there is no fear in love how many times does jesus tell his uh, disciples do not be afraid do not be afraid do not be afraid you look at the life of jesus did he have opportunity to be afraid when they grabbed him in nazareth and they took him to the top of a mountain they wanted to throw him over the edge of the mountain and if they had he wouldn't have died on the cross or shed his blood and you know was he afraid did he have opportunity to be afraid yes he did but he never yielded to that this jesus tell you don't be tired don't be sleepy don't be hungry no because he knows that's what you're going to that's that's natural that's normal somehow we have managed to say fear is also normal but i'm telling you scripture does not tell you that fear is not normal fear is not meant to be your normal faith is meant to be your normal there is a biblical principle according to your faith be it unto you and there's a sense in which faith paints a picture faith is the evidence of things not seen when i have faith for something i paint a picture in my mind of that thing that i have faith for for that situation that i have faith for that deliverance that i'm looking for that that breakthrough that i'm looking for i paint that picture in my mind faith does that but do you know fear does that as well when you dwell on fear fear paints a picture and it paints that picture of that horrible thing that you are dreading may happen and one of the things i've i've learned through many painful situations in life is when you face your crisis if you give in to fear you are laying out a platform for the enemy to continue to attack you about 5 years ago we were having a family get together and uh, we were all in in my mother's house except my nephew ashwin who you all know and he was in college because he had some lab to attend or some story like that he told us and anyway, we he went and there was no lab and he walked up there and realized there was a sports event happening and they were going to have a marathon a 5 km run and he hadn't had breakfast and he hadn't had lunch and it was 2 o'clock in the afternoon and he decided that he's going to join and he looked around at the competition and said i can do this and he decided he's going to do the run and he ran and the last thing he remembers he was in second place and there was one more lap to go and that is the last thing he remembers he blanked out at that point he came in second but he passed out before the last lap and he collapsed they took him they were taking him to uh, the hospital and giving him iv and he was he was out and then they called us and told us and uh, we were like that guy you know what's wrong with him why do you have to go to that? and we said okay give him some iv and all that when he's better we'll see maybe we'll come there and pick him up or he can tomorrow okay catch a bus and come here and he went into hospital but then vijay the elder of the church in cochin called and said something's not right he started turning violent and so vijay was going to the hospital to find out just at that time a colleague of vijay's called him and vijay said hey you know sunil son is in hospital and this what happened that guy freaked out he says rush get him out of that hospital take him to a good hospital it was a government hospital take him to a good hospital i lost this guy was in the navy he said i lost a cadet last week he died exactly same symptoms suddenly we realized things were worse we they went picked him up took him to another hospital and basically what had happened is because of dehydration because of the heat he hadn't drunk water the body went into something called as i can't remember the name now where the muscles start breaking down 
and the muscles break down and it starts flooding the system with that and his kidneys stop functioning. And he was in hospital, in ICU. So my brother and I got in the car and we, we said, okay, we'll drive to Kerala. It was about a two hour journey. And about halfway there, the doctor called us and said, uh, I want to let you know that we are in a crisis right now. His potassium levels have reached nine. If they go higher, he goes into cardiac arrest and there's nothing we can do to stop it. What do you do? What is the picture that fear is painting? My brother said, I saw my son in a, car, in a, cock, in a coffin. We stopped the car and I said, you will not think those thoughts. You will not give room for fear. We are going to praise God for the next one hour that we drive. You are not allowed to what if that happens. I, I, you know, we took a decision that I will not yield to fear. We just kept praying and praising God and we refused to let our minds go in that direction. You know how it is. Your mind will take you there. It will drag you there. And you have to force yourself saying, I will not go there. We walked into the ICU and we laid our hands on him and prayed for him. And his kidneys started functioning. The nurses also came and they stood there when we prayed. And uh, his potassium levels started coming down. And he's okay. It took him five days before that, whatever that thing was, came down to, to zero. Fear is your enemy. You have to take this seriously. You've got to learn to fight the battle of faith. You've got to make choices in the small things when fear comes, when anxiety comes, when worry comes, to say, no, that's not my response. I will not respond with that. I will respond with faith. In every situation, I will respond in faith. That's what God is calling me to do. My last point. So what builds faith? What builds faith? The word of God builds faith. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do you prove something? How do you prove something? You're in a laboratory and they say, okay, prove this. And then you, you take it and you try it until you get that result. For you to bring forth the proof of that transformation, your mind has to be renewed. See, as long as we live, the world is designed to steal your faith. We are in a world where we are bombarded by media, whether it's the television, the computer, your phone, social media, YouTube. Your, we are, we are, the devil has got us. He set up the system so that your brain is constantly being flooded by the systems of the world, let me tell you, they don't bring faith in your life. If you want to be a man and woman of faith, the word of God has to be the dominant factor in your life. Your mind has to be renewed by the way the word is. 1 John 5.20 says that, the Son of God came to give us an understanding, and this is the understanding that we are in Him. That we are in Him. That I am in Christ. So when I read scripture, and I see Jesus going into a crisis, and there's a person that needs healing, and there's, a, there's food that needs to be multiplied, or there's this incredible difficult situation, or one thing after the other. Where am I? I'm in Christ. Who am I? The same spirit that dwelled in Christ dwells inside of me. When you allow the word of God to renew your mind, and that becomes the definition of this is what the right response. You know, we've got the, the band, right? What would Jesus do? 
You can't look at the band and try to figure out what would Jesus do. You've got to know the scripture. The scripture's got to be in you and then it becomes your second reaction. Your first reaction. The word of God builds faith. Hearing God. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You read your Bible. But you also hear God. You listen to him. When he tells you something, suddenly you have the boldness to stand up for that. Even if everybody around you says, you're an idiot, please shut up. But when he has spoken to you, you have faith. You can stand up. The nature of God gives you faith. When you understand that every good and perfect gift is from above, and comes from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation, no shadow of turning. He's not in a bad mood one day, in a good mood another day. He's not going to bless you today and take it all away tomorrow. He's not going to bring, you know, trouble one day and the next day, he, because he's in a good mood, he do, does something else. That's not God the Father. He's always in a good mood because of Calvary. towards you. His eyes towards you are a look of delight because you're in Christ. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and I'm in him. And he looks at me with that longing that I may be all that he has written over my life before the foundations of the world. The nature of God. And finally, to understand his love, I in them you in me, that they may be perfect in one, that the world may know me. Know you have sent me and have loved them. Look up the word. Look up that word over there. It says you have loved them in proportion and degree just as you have loved me. That God the Father loves us exactly as he loves Jesus. When this becomes your reality, faith rises up. Let's close our eyes and pray. Father, we want to bless you. I want to thank you. I pray, Lord, that even today that we may take this seriously. That we want to be men and women of faith. We don't want to be people who just live lives, who come Sunday after Sunday. We want to be people who walk in faith, who grow in faith. We want to be all that you've called us to be. Here we are, Lord. We just want to say yes and amen to all the incredible promises that you have over our lives. Thank you, Father. Lord, we stretch forward in faith, believing that you're going to teach us and move us and cause us to live very differently from how it's been so far. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. have the bread come forward? Yeah. If you turn in your Bibles, you'll come to the table. If somebody can send word to the children, uh, Sayola, could you do that? Just could somebody take, yeah, thanks, uh, Alyssa. If you look, uh, turn in your Bible to um, John chapter 6 and verse 47. John chapter 6, verse 47. <clears throat> Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me, one who has faith in me, one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna, in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. 
Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This bread that came down from heaven, your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Our life is in Jesus Christ. And these words speak about us feeding on Jesus spiritually. Jesus said, you live with me, you live with me, you live in me as I live in you. You will live and your life would bring forth fruit. And so let's just ponder, let's come to Jesus and uh, say, Jesus, I put my faith in you. I put my trust in you. Jesus is the answer for our life, the totality of our life. Whatever we need, we see in our life, Jesus is the answer. We can go to many things to to find life. We can look to our marriage partner to give life, to supply us what we need. But that is not the answer. Jesus is. We can look to our career. We can look to our work to give us the joy, the satisfaction. But th those things, sooner or later, will disappoint us. Jesus is the life giver. He is the joy giver. And he is the answer. We can look at hobbies. We can look at things that we like. Movies, television program. But they are not the life-giving source Jesus is. And the core of it is Jesus giving his life for us on the cross. His body for us, broken. His blood poured out. The cancelling, the washing away of our sin. The covenant established by the blood of Jesus. Can we affirm our trust in him? Can we turn to him in repentance? Where you know there are things that you look for joy and satisfaction, things you look for, for life. Friends, let's turn to Jesus in repentance, in faith, God, we put our trust in you. We put our trust in your great love. We know and rely on the love God has for us. 
Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he took the bread. 